Good morning and welcome to Braille Institute. My name is Judy Hill and I'm the Educational Programs Manager of the Braille Institute team. On behalf of the entire Braille Institute team, I want to thank you for joining us for our annual Macular Degeneration Seminar and Technology Fair. I also want to take a quick moment to thank some very special people the staff here at Braille Institute who put this event together. Mari Abrams, Christina Chavez, Francis Daniels, Myra Gonzalez, Elma Lohman, and Manuel Mariani. As you know, Braille Institute provides all of its services for free thanks to the generous philanthropic support from private donors. Our donors make all of our wonderful programs and services possible, from art and braille education to orientation and mobility, and from children's services to our outreach and education in senior centers. Today's seminar... Hello. Can you make the loudspeaker louder so we can hear better? Okay, our, our technology person will do that. Today's seminar is made possible thanks to a grant from the Mita and George Rosenberg Foundation. The foundation has been generously supporting our annual Macular Degeneration Seminar since 2004. Mita Rosenberg was an Emmy Award winning television producer, story editor, agent, and director whose career spans 65 years. She was diagnosed with macular degeneration in her later years and became a Braille Institute library patron. Asked what advice she might give someone who has lost one of his senses, her response was inspirational. As long as you're alive, she said, you should be living. We're grateful to the Mita and George Rosenberg Foundation and its executive director, Sue Allweiler, who has been one of our most caring donors, regularly attending events in support of Braille Institute. Ms. Allweiler, would you please wave your hand? She's in the back so we could thank you for your continued support. Yay. Together with organizations like Enhanced Vision and Centrosite, who also supported us today, we are able to educate and inform the public about living well with low vision, and in so doing, help remind people to live life to the fullest. Enhanced Vision is one of the leading developers of accessible technology for people with low vision. Centrosite is a new treatment program using a tiny telescope that is implanted inside the eye to improve vision and quality of life to patients with the most advanced form of macular degeneration. Be sure to check out their table at the technology fair as they've had some exciting recent advances in their technology. And of course, we are pleased to welcome again physicians from the Retina Institute of California, the largest retina group in the Western United States. At the Retina Institute of California, doctors utilize the latest modern equipment to accurately and efficiently diagnose retinal conditions and provide all of the most current treatments, including many only available through research protocols. Today, we have three wonderful speakers. Dr. Michael Davis will talk about advances in age-related macular degeneration. Dr. Jessica Bachman will talk about treatment and care of diabetic retinopathy. And a newer addition to this event, Julian Vargas, a mobile and assistive technology specialist who has worked with the Department of Rehab to educate people with no and low vision about how technology can help them. Each speaker will have a short question and answer period after his presentation. While we would take as many questions as possible in the scheduled question and answer period, we want you to know that if your question does not get answered during today's presentation, the speakers will be available after the final presentation to help answer your specific questions. Following the final presenter, 
But before the technology fair reopens, we are excited to remind you that Mark Gregett from Enhanced Vision will be announcing opportunity drawing winners from today's event. You were all entered into a drawing when you signed in this morning. There are over 200 of you here today, and we have many prizes, so you want to be sure to listen for your name. Enhanced Vision will raffle off our grand prize today, a free Pebble HD valued at nearly $600. The Pebbles small, lightweight design makes it a perfect companion for magnification at home or on the go. Remember, you must be present to win. Now, before we begin the seminar, please take a moment to turn off all cell phones and other electronic devices. And if you are using an interpretation device, please be sure to turn it in at the end of this event. They need it louder still if you can, guys. OK. Now we're going on to our presenters. Dr. Michael Davis of the Retina Institute of California completed his undergraduate and medical degrees through an accelerated program at Kent State University and the Northeastern Ohio University's College of Medicine. He graduated summa cum laude with a Bachelor of Science degree from Kent State University. After earning his medical degree, Dr. Davis completed his internship and his ophthalmology residency at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, Illinois, where he served as chief resident. Dr. Davis specializes in the medical and surgical management of many retinal conditions, including diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration, dislocated intraocular lenses, macular holes, and retinal detachment. He has published several peer-reviewed articles in a wide variety of medical journals and has presented his work at both national and international conferences. He is a member of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the American Society of Retina Specialists, the Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology, and many other high-profile professional organizations. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Davis. All right. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay. If you can't, just yell out. I know you're not shy. <laughs> um, thanks again for having me here. I think this is my fourth year talking to everyone. And every year I come, it gets bigger and bigger. This morning, it was standing room only until they brought out more chairs. So it's really good to see um, all the familiar faces that I've seen here before and then some new faces as well. Uh, as she mentioned, I'm going to be speaking this morning about age-related macular degeneration. There are several different types of macular degeneration. But this morning, I'm just going to focus on the age-related form. Um, as she mentioned, there will be a time for questions at the end of my presentation, so please try to uh, hold any questions until the end. Um, and as I always say, also try to limit your questions. Try not to ask um, any personal medical questions, as I may not be able to answer them. So before we talk about age-related macular degeneration, we need to know a little bit about the anatomy of the eye and what part of the eye the macular degeneration affects. It affects the retina. Well, what is the retina, you may ask? The retina is actually the seeing tissue that lines the inside wall of an eye. The way I explain this to my patients is if your eye were this room, it would be like the wallpaper on the edge of, whoops, excuse me, on the edge of this room. And that's analogous to what the retina would be. It lines the inside wall of the eye. If you think of the eye like a camera, the function of the retina is like the film of the camera. The light is focused to the back of the eye where it hits the retina, and then the retina is the seeing tissue that then processes that image that your eye sees and transfers it to your brain so that you're able to uh, get a picture of what is around you. The macula, which we'll talk about, is not a separate organ, but instead it's a region of the retina. It's the very center part of your retina, and that's where your fine vision comes from. So when your eye doctor has you 
read the chart in his office, you're using the part of your retina called the macula. And it's in the very center of the eye. So age-related macular degeneration, as the name implies, uh, it happens as you get older, so it's affected by uh, aging. And it's a degeneration, meaning a breakdown of the tissue. So in short, it's a breakdown of the retina or the macula, your central vision, as you get older. It is the leading cause of severe vision loss in the United States in patients over the age of uh, 50 years old. So who gets age-related macular degeneration? Well, as I already mentioned, uh, as implied by the name, it's more common as you get older. Generally, this does not happen before you reach the age of 50, and then it exponentially increases as the aging population uh, gets older. It's also a little bit more common in females, about two to one, ma uh, females to males. And it happens in patients who are less pigmented. So it's more common in Caucasians, uh, less common in African Americans. So as you look at the prevalence, that's what this graph here shows. As the aging population, you can see around age 50, this graph is pretty low. But as you get up to about 80 or over 80, it increases pretty dramatically. And as you can imagine, people in now are living longer. There's been a lot of advances in medicine that have allowed patients to live longer, so there are a lot more patients that are developing age-related macular degeneration simply because patients are living longer. Another risk factor is cigarette smoking. If you're a cigarette smoker, you have a seven times the risk of the general population of developing an advanced form of age-related macular degeneration. So one of the first things I tell any of my patients, whether they have macular degeneration or not, or whether at risk for it, is to stop smoking. Um, it's good for your eyes, good for your heart, good for your brain to stop. So if anybody still smokes, please try to stop. Um, also, it's uh, more associated with high blood pressure. So high blood pressure has been shown to be a risk factor for uh, more advanced macular degeneration as well. Uh, there's some thought about the process as to why people develop it, but years and years of UV or sunlight exposure is one of the risk factors. Um, so that's why we encourage younger patients to wear uh, sunglasses when they're out. Um, there are some sort of um, cataract surgeries now. The lenses that they use in cataract surgery have um, a UV protector in it to try to help protect the eyes from UV exposure. It's also associated with um, high fat high cholesterol and obesity. Um, lower levels if you have a healthier diet, green leafy vegetables, um, lots of beta carotene and other nutrients that are helpful for the eyes. It also runs in families. There's a genetic component to macular degeneration. Um, there are a couple of genetic tests that are on the market that aren't widely used as of yet, mainly because we're not really sure what to do with the information yet. Um, but in the future, I think genetics will play a very important role in both the diagnosis and the treatment of age-related macular degeneration. But if you look at this graph here, in the general population by the age of 80, patients have about a 10% risk of developing macular degeneration. If you have a first-degree family member with macular degeneration, so that's a mother, brother, um, father, or child, your uh, risk increases four times. So you have a 40% chance of developing um, macular degeneration with a family history. This is um, one of the genetic tests. It's actually just a cheek swab. Uh, we were doing this in our office, um, uh, but we got to the point, actually, it, was, it stopped being covered by Medicare. One, because Medicare asked, well, what are you doing with this information? We would identify patients at high risk, but unfortunately, at the point where we were determining they were high risk, there was no treatment to offer them. So there wasn't anything more that we were offering them other than letting them know that they are higher risk. So how many people in the United States suffer from age-related macular degeneration? Well, it's estimated that about 7.5 million patients have the early stages of macular degeneration. And in a minute, I'll go over what each of these stages are and what we see on exam and what the patients may experience with each of these. But generally, in the early stages, the patients will have no symptoms, so they wouldn't really seek an eye doctor to be evaluated for this. About 3.5 million have high-risk 
what we call dry macular degeneration. So they have features that make them high risk for vision loss, but they have not lost vision yet. Uh, but they may uh, within the next year or so if they com continue to progress. And then about a million patients have what we call advanced dry macular degeneration, where they have the dry form of macular degeneration and do have severe vision loss, meaning they can't read the eye chart um, very well. And then about one and a half million people go on to develop what we term the form of wet macular degeneration. And I'll go over all these forms in just a minute. And as I mentioned before, the prevalence is increasing. With new medical technologies allowing patients to live longer, the number of patients that are being diagnosed with macular degeneration is increasing exponentially. In the year 2000, it was estimated that about 1.75 million patients had advanced macular degeneration. And on this graph, as you see, by the year 2020, there's about a 60% increase where about 3 million patients will uh, suffer from advanced macular degeneration. So there's a lot of research going on. We're involved in a lot of clinical trials, both new treatments for the wet form, which we have some treatments for, and also some treatments for the dry form, which at this point, there are no effective treatments for the dry form of macular degeneration. So I've been mentioning the two types of macular degeneration. They're not really two separate diseases, but they're kind of a spectrum of the same disease. So the dry form of macular degeneration is the most common, and generally it is the least, um, the least symptomatic, meaning most patients with the dry form of macular degeneration don't suffer severe vision loss. And as I said before, it's about 10% of the population over the age of 55 has signs of dry macular degeneration. The wet form of macular degeneration generally causes more severe vision loss, and about 10% of patients who have dry macular degeneration will go on to develop what we call the wet form of macular degeneration. So what do we see? Well, in the dry form of macular degeneration, the basic lesion that we see when we look in your eye, when the eye doctor looks in your eye, it's called a drusen. And if you look at this picture here, this is your, the optic nerve, so this is the optic nerve. These are the blood vessels in the back of the eye. This area here is what we call the macula, so this is the very center of your vision. These little yellow spots here are not normal. These are the drusen. So when we look in the eye, we see these little yellow spots in the eye, and we call those drusen. And what those are, those are buildup of waste products that occur under the retina after years and years of damage. What I uh, tell my patients is just like you can get age spots on your hand as you get older, these are almost like age spots in the back of your eye, and that's a good way to think about it. They're not exactly analogous, but that's a good way for you to think about it. So what happens with the dry form of macular degeneration? Well, after years and years, these little yellow spots build up where you get more and more and more of them, and they start to sometimes form together. And once they start to coalesce or become in groups, then the retina that overlies them can start to wear away. And that's when we start to tell patients that they have what we call atrophy, or a wearing away of the retina. And in that case, you can start to have vision changes from the dry form of macular degeneration. So once they coalesce even further, you get these larger areas of atrophy, and you can have severe vision loss from atrophy, because you have these large areas in your center of vision that are essentially worn away. What I tell my patients, it's like if you walked up and down this carpet for 80 years, eventually you would see a worn away area in the middle of this carpet. And that's what happens in the middle of the retina in patients who develop this severe form of the dry macular degeneration, is they basically have a wearing away of their retina where it no longer functions. Now, the wet form of macular degeneration, basically, like I said, 10% of patients with the dry form can then go on to form the wet form. What happens here is, in the dry form, when the retina wears away, it's almost like you're starting to develop holes in the retina or areas where it's thinner. And then, in some patients, you can get abnormal blood vessels from under the retina that start to grow through the retina. And that's when you get bleeding and fluid under the retina, and that's when it becomes what we call wet. And we call it wet because there's blood and fluid under the retina. It's analogous. Here's a picture here. Um, so this is the retina. And you get a, basically a crack or a wearing away, and then you get these abnormal blood vessels that start to grow up. And I tell my patients it's almost like a weed that just grew up through a crack in their sidewalk. 
So why do we differentiate between the two forms of the macular degeneration or the two spectrums of macular degeneration? Well, it's one, it's important for prognosis. In general, the dry form has a good prognosis for most patients, and the wet form left untreated has a bad prognosis. And the other important reason is for the treatment. Dry, at this point, we don't have an effective treatment for the dry macular degeneration. I'll go over in a minute some things that you can do to prevent the dry from converting to the wet, but again, we don't have an effective treatment for the dry on its own. Um, the wet, though, does require urgent treatment. Within a day or two, once it converts to wet, we need to start treating patients to try to prevent further vision loss. And I'll go over the treatments in just a minute. So how do we diagnose your eyes? So if you came to see me as a patient, what would you experience in my office? Well, one, we check your vision. I think everyone's probably familiar with looking at the eye chart and uh, having the eye doctor or their assistant have you read the letters. We'll check the pressure in your eye, um, and then we dilate your eye, which is everyone's favorite part of going to the eye doctor. We put the drops in your eyes, and they dilate your pupil, and everything is very sensitive to light. And then we'll do a complete eye exam. And Often, on our eye exam alone, we can determine whether or not you have signs of macular degeneration and whether it's the dry or the wet form. But oftentimes, we have to do ancillary testing, one, to be 100% sure whether it's dry or wet, and to see how much leakage is there or how much bleeding is there. Some of the tests we do, one is called an OCT, or an opt optical coherence tomography, which is essentially almost like an x-ray or a scan of the eye. Um, where it basically takes a cross-section of the eye and lets us see the retina in very clear detail. Sometimes we'll take special pictures, and um, another test that we'll often do for patients with macular degeneration is called fluorescein angiography. And for this test, we actually inject a little vegetable dye through a blood vessel and then take a series of pictures in the back of the eye to see the circulation in the back of the eye and see how much leakage there is. And this is just an example of what the fluorescein angiogram would look like, and these are the blood vessels lighting up. This is really the gold standard. Oftentimes on some tests you can tell, but really the gold standard is the dye test that your eye doctor will do. This is an image of the OCT. This is a cross-section of the retina, and the advances in OCT uh, technology that we have now, we can actually see each individual layer of the retina, uh, which is only about 250 microns thick, so it's very, very advanced. These are actually drusen, which are the little bumps under the retina. And then this is a patient with very severe wet macular degeneration. You can see from the previous image, there are these big black areas here. This is fluid within the retina. There's some blood under the retina here. So on this patient, just from this test alone, it would be pretty obvious to the eye doctor that um, there's severe macular degeneration. So your doctor tells you that you have macular degeneration. So what do you do now? As I mentioned, currently for the dry form of macular degeneration, we don't have a very good effective treatment uh, for it. We can only uh, do things to try to prevent it from advancing and prevent it from getting worse. The one thing that I mentioned before is to stop smoking. So again, I encourage everyone to stop smoking. Uh, we also tell our patients to do some dietary modifications, green leafy vegetables, uh, low-fat diet, low-cholesterol diet. If they're not exercising, try to get them on an exercise regimen. Because as I mentioned before, obesity is related to more advanced forms of macular degeneration. Uh, there was a large study done by the National Eye Institute looking at specific uh, vitamins, and that was called the Age-Related Eye Disease Study, or the AREDS. And they just released the second arm of that study. So there's special vitamins that if your uh, eye doctor tells you that you have advanced forms or more advanced forms of the dry form of macular degeneration, they re may recommend these special vitamins. And they'll tell you to make sure that the label says AREDS2 on it. And then the other important thing in patients with dry macular degeneration is for them to monitor their vision at home. Because patients can see me in the office one day, and the very next day, they could be dry one day, and the very next day, they can have bleeding under the retina. It can convert to the wet form of macular degeneration that quickly. So it can go from one day to the other. So that's why home monitoring is very important, because I can't, you know, as much as I like seeing my patients, I can't physically see my patients every day to monitor for conversion to the wet form of macular degeneration. 
So it's very important for them to check their eye one eye at a time. So I tell them to cover one eye. And I give them a special grid that's called an Amsler grid. And it's this grid right here. Looks like a piece of graph paper. And what they monitor for is a change in that. So normally when someone looks at a piece of graph paper, it's very straight and very orderly. When they start to have bleeding or fluid under the retina, it starts to look very distorted like this, where they may have a black area in the middle of the grid, or the lines may be very uh, wavy and distorted. And if that happens, I tell them that they need to come in within a day or two to be checked to be sure that, one, to make sure if it is the wet form of macular degeneration, we can start treatment right away. So now your doctor tells you that you have wet macular degeneration. What would you expect from this? Well, I give the same recommendations to my patients, so I still tell them all the dietary modifications because you want to try to prevent it from getting any worse. And most patients have two eyes, so you want to make sure if one eye is wet, the other eye is dry, that you're doing everything you can to prevent their other eye from converting to the wet form. And then as I mentioned, there is a treatment for the wet form of macular degeneration. The treatment involves an injection of medicine into the eye once a month. Now, most patients need a series of four or five shots, and sometimes that will take care of it. But some patients may need lifelong treatment where they need a shot in the eye that's affected every month for the rest of their lives. There's three different medications that we currently use, and there are several different medications on the horizon, some of which last longer than a month. So, and actually one of the newer ones we have, this ILEA medication, in some patients they can go to every other month injection. So that you know, save some of the, the burden on the patient of the monthly injections. Um, there are some new medications coming out that could go every three or four months as well. And that's kind of the goal in treating the wet form of macular degeneration is to find a treatment that's longer lasting because coming in once a month for a shot in your eye doesn't sound pleasant to anybody I know. And the other thing I mentioned to my patients is it is a chronic disease. So even if we get to a point where we stop the injections, I still have to monitor them very frequently because it's not a cure. So they still may require further injections um, as they go along. Now, one of the future treatments for the dry form of macular degeneration, and one of the things we're involved with at the Retina Institute of California, is a stem cell trial for the treatment. And what we do in this trial is we actually implant stem cells under the retina to try to regenerate those areas of atrophy that have worn away. Um, we've gone through two phases. Um, we're currently recruiting for phase 2B right now, um, and that should go ahead within the next year or two um, uh, if everything goes well with the FDA. Um, but we're also involved in many other clinical trials. Like I mentioned, there's other new uh, medications that are being uh, evaluated for the treatment of wet macular degeneration. And there are also other treatments, um, certain medications, both oral, uh, so taking by mouth, or an injection in the eye for the treatment of the dry form of macular degeneration. So because this is such a large area of, uh, uh, it's a large problem for uh, patients, there's a lot of research going into it. So if anybody would like to um, schedule a visit with us, this is our phone number, the 800 number. I also left some of my cards out at the Enhanced Vision uh, table, too, that has their, our main phone number as well. So if anybody wants to come in for an evaluation, a second opinion, or if you think you may qualify for one of our clinical trials, um, that would be an option, too. So I think at this point, I'll start taking some questions. Yes, sir, in the hat in the back. The average success rate for cataract removal, uh, the, it's very good, actually. It's probably 98 to 99 percent uh, success rate for cataract surgery without complications. The complication for cataract surgery is, is fairly low at this point uh, due to a lot of advances in, uh, in surgical technique. Uh, the next speaker that's coming up, Dr. Bachman, I personally don't do cataract surgery. I just do retina surgery. Um, but she also does cataract surgery, so that may be a question for her, too. Okay. Yes, on the left over here. Um, or. Oh, wait. Oh, wait, just one minute. Two people are asking a question at the same time. Here, oh, wait one second. They're going to bring a microphone around so that we can, that'll make it easier.
Oh, okay, I was asking about the uh, macular degeneration. I know you were mentioning that there were some meds, but I wonder if there is laser treatment for this, and how does this work? That's a very, very good question. Um, I usually leave laser out of my presentations because uh, we don't very frequently use laser to treat macular degeneration any longer. Um, there's two different forms that in the past we used to use laser. Um, we used to use a hot laser, which basically burns the retina. So when these abnormal blood vessels start to grow under the retina, you zap them with the laser to get them to basically dry up and you burn them away. But imagine this, you know, the bleeding is right in the center of your vision. So now I take a laser and I do laser right in the center of your vision. You lose vision. So in the past, before we had these medications, that's all we could offer patients. But it was a pretty hard sell because the patient's vision would actually get worse right after the laser, sometimes significantly worse. So you try to tell the patients, okay, I'm going to do this procedure. Your vision's going to get a lot worse. But in five years from now, your vision is going to be better than it would be if I didn't do the laser today. So how many people would sign up for that treatment? Exactly. So, um, I mean, we did it very frequently, but again, it was a very difficult thing to explain to patients and to, and to tell patients. Um, there is another form of laser. Sometimes it's referred to as cold laser. And what this is, we inject a medication through a blood vessel and then use uh, an infrared laser. So it doesn't actually burn the retina, but it targets specific areas of leakage. Uh, but again, with this, there's a lot of side effects. The patients would have to basically be fully covered for several days because if they went out in the sun, they would get severe sunburn. Um, and it wasn't as effective. You would still lose vision, not as much as you would with the hot laser or the burning laser. Uh, but in general, most patients still um, did lose vision uh, with that laser. Uh, so when these new medications that we inject in the eye came about, basically it revolutionized the treatment of macular degeneration. Now that's not to say that there aren't certain cases where we may still use a laser. So if you have an area that's not right in the center of your vision, that may be amenable to laser. And sometimes we use that cold laser in a lower dosage combined with, um, combined with the injections in some patients who aren't responding to the injections alone. and then we'll come to you. Thank you. What's the difference in treatment strategy between age-related macular degeneration and non-age-related macular degen degeneration? So when um, other forms of macular degeneration, one of the most, other most common types is called myopic degeneration, which is when people are very, very nearsighted, they can get changes similar to uh, age-related macular degeneration. If they develop bleeding under the retina, similar to the age-related form, the treatment is exactly the same. So we give the same medications uh, and the same injections. So any type of macular degeneration that develops these abnormal blood vessels, we give the same uh, treatment with the injections into the eye. Um, the dietary modifications won't help with those patients, though, because theirs is more of a function of how their eye was built. Their eye is a longer, and so it gets stretched, and that's why they develop macular degeneration. It's not. Um, because of you know external factors like UV light and diet and things like that. Actually, there was a question up here. What is, did you define what you mean by geographic degeneration? So geographic atrophy just means that there's a large area that's worn away in the retina. So we call it geographic because it almost looks like a, like a country or a geography. So it's a larger area. Rather than some people get little tiny um, uh, basically smaller areas of atrophy, but once they start to coalesce into a larger area, that's when we call it geographic atrophy. Are there any other trials underway for, uh, besides stem cell implants, any other implants or transplants? Um, so there are, um, so stem cell is the big one. There are some uh, uh, other trials, like I said, certain medications and things like that. Um, there is, um, visit the centrosite uh, booth in the back, there is an implantable telescope that uh, is amenable to some patients with macular degeneration. Um, they have to have severe central vision loss in both eyes, um, and they cannot have had cataract surgery before. And so then one eye would get a telescope and the other eye uh, does not get the telescope. And then there's a question right here in the front. If somebody could bring the. What is the degree of loss of vision over the years or months with uh, macular degeneration? 
So it, right. So the question was, what is the degree of vision loss with macular degeneration? And it's with, over age. It's very variable. So it varies from patient to patient. Some patients can have pretty what we would consider pretty severe changes of the of the dry macular degeneration and may not have any vision loss at all and then some patients have a very quick progression over a year or two um, so it's hard to answer that question because it varies from patient to patient hello can you hear me i can yes over here i see you yeah i have a question uh, is there any advance in a study is on NAION. On NAION? Yeah. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, Any treatment? Unfortunately, in most cases, there is not a treatment. Um, he asked about a condition called NAION, which is um, it's called an ischemic optic neuropathy, where it's essentially a stroke to the optic nerve in the back of the eye. Um, and it's often related to high blood pressure, diabetes, and other systemic conditions. Um, there's some medications that can cause it, so if, it's, if there's a known cause for it, stopping that medication will sometimes reverse the damage, but not always. Um, but as far as I know, now I don't do uh, neuro-ophthalmology, which would be more of that subspecialty, so I, I, I don't know of any studies, but that's not to say that there aren't any studies currently. Over here. Oh, doctor. Over here. Hello, doctor. Yes. Right here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I, can't I have see had you. Uh, a dry <laughs> macular, okay. dry chat, dry <laughs> macular degeneration for at least ten years. Uh, I can see very uh, uh, read things with great difficulty on if I have bright light on it. However, I and it has an advance, but. Uh, if I look can stand in front of somebody, I don't see their features sharply. I can only see their head and their torso and so forth. But I wanted to know, is there such a thing, thing as phantom vision with macular degeneration where you see objects in front of you that are moving that you know aren't there and they move around? They, you, I could be in a car and I could see something moving in the street like it's moving toward us or I can see people walking in front uh, outside the window on the sidewalk. Right. Uh, a number of people, and I know they're not there. It's like phantom vision. Is That's that a, a phenomenon that it is. you've it's ever a, it's heard of? It's a very well-known phenomenon. So well-known it actually has a name. It's called Charles Bonnet syndrome. Was, it's called Charles Bonnet syndrome. It is. It's related to severe. It can happen in pa with any patients who have severe vision loss, um, but it's very common in patients with advanced macular degeneration. And basically what happens is you have these visual hallucinations, um, and sometimes patients think that they might be going crazy, and you have to assure them that they're not. Um, I have patients who, uh, it comes in different forms. Some patients will see patterns, so they'll look out a window and think that there's skyscrapers out their window when they live nowhere near any skyscrapers. Some, one of my patients, she sees uh, faces of uh, people on her wall or animals. Um, so sometimes they can be very formed hallucinations. Um, there, uh, there's, unfortunately, there's not a good treatment for it um, where it's very difficult to treat. Most patients that experience it, it it's short lasting. Usually it only lasts six months to a year and then it stops happening. So I don't know how long, it, how long you've been experiencing these symptoms, but in general, once you reassure patients that, one, they're not going crazy, that this is a normal phenomenon that happens, it's essentially, you know, your, your retina wants to see, your eyes want to see, and when they can't see anymore, sometimes your brain starts to play tricks on you. Um, and, there, you know, we've looked at different medications, some uh, anti-epileptic medications, so anti-seizure medicines. And, you know, in some patients they work, some patients they don't. Um, in general, most of my patients that have experienced this, you know, it, it's short-lasting and it, it goes away. And once you reassure them and that they know that they're not real or that they're not going crazy, that they can live with the, with the visions that they see. You're welcome. We have a question over here. Um, the gentleman beside me would like to know about a possibility of a corneal transplant. Okay, uh, so cor there, it is very possible for a corneal transplant. Um, I don't do corneal transplants, but uh, corneal transplants is one of the first tissues of the eye that we've been able to transplant. Um, and so if you have a corneal scar or something like that, 
um, you can have a corneal transplant. Okay, I got a question. Maybe. Yes, sir. Uh, in those two, uh, in where you say about the vitamins. Yes. Uh, uh, there's that uh, lutein and the other, zexanthin or something like that? Zeaxanthin. Uh, what milligrams do you uh, recommend people to take on that? Because there's so many out there with low uh, milligrams so, and then... Right. Whatever. What I would recommend is getting the formulation that specifically has all of the vitamins together in one and then taking that together. Yeah, but I mean, there's some like uh, one, five percent and... Right, but if you get the ARIDS formula, the A-R-E-D-S formulation, it will have the specific amount that you need in it. Okay, thank okay. you. Good question. There's a question up here at the front. Um, yes, um, I know this is about macular degeneration, but I have ROP. Okay. And I want to know if there is any research that they're doing or if there's anything that is being that they can do now. Um, so she had asked about ret uh, retinopathy of prematurity, which is a uh, retina condition that can happen when babies are born prematurely. Their retina doesn't fully develop. Um, as, as far as I know, there is no spe I, we, I don't know of any specific research being done for ROP uh, in general. Our hope is, though, that some of these trials with stem cells, um, the way that uh, trials work is you have to have a group of patients where there's a significant number of patients with the disease. And oftentimes, once you find an effective treatment for one of these diseases, so if we find something effective for age-related macular degeneration, they may be able to then use that in other ocular conditions as well. Um, but as far as I know, I don't know of anything specific for ROP at this time. A quick comment, oops, a, a quick comment with regard to uh, the phantom vision? Yes. There's probably a homeopathic remedy that would work for that kind of condition. Depending on the person, uh, it would have to be tailored to them. But for some of those kinds of uh, hallucinations and other, some relatively minor vision problems, homeopathic treatment could work. Yeah, comment. I agree. Um, one of my patients underwent, um, um, you know, she went through this regimen of mas massage therapy um, and acupuncture and things like that, and she did get some relief from her symptoms with that. I don't know of any homeopathic oh, pills or anything like that that I've heard of that would help, but um, um, and there may be, exactly, so. Uh, question here, please. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Okay, that's all. Um, I have. Okay, last question. Uh, Before in, they bring out the hook and pull me off in, the stage. In one eye, I don't see in the middle, but the good eye started having some kind of little um, blind spots. I don't know what that is. Okay. A little blind spot in the good eye. You're having little black spots in the good eye? Little, no, they're not. I can, when I read, I see a few letters, then I don't see. Right. Then I see a few letters. Then I don't see. Yeah, it's hard but to I, say. There's a lot of things that could cause that. I would recommend, you know, either following up with your eye doctor about if it's something recent, or um, I'd be happy to see you too. Okay, but there's a lot of things that can cause that, so I can't really comment on what it what it could be. Thank you very much, Dr. Davis. I want to remind you guys that at the end, there w the doctors will be available to take your questions if you don't get a chance to ask them now. OK? So it is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker of the day, Dr. Jessica Bachman, also of the Rent Institute of California. Dr. Bachman is a comprehensive ophthalmologist who specializes in medically treating diseases of the retina and vitreous.
chairs over here to my left as well. Again, I ask that you turn your, your uh, I was going to say your televisions, your <laughs> cell phones. See, that's my way of making sure you're listening to me. Uh, turn your cell phones down, please, uh, because we don't want to be disruptive to anyone. And if anyone who is listening to the, the, our version in Spanish and you're having difficulty, I think if we move you better to the back of the room, closer to where the interpreter is, you'll have a better reception. So just let me know what your needs are and we'll do our best to accommodate you, okay? Thank you very much. Good morning. Thanks for coming today. Um, I'll be talking about diabetic eye disease. How many people in here have diabetes? Quite a few of you. It's very common. So diabetes um, is a metabolic disease that's associated with high blood sugar. There are two types. There's type 1 that normally occurs in young children and type 2 which occurs in adults and even now with the obesity epidemic it's occurring in children as well. Um, prevention and treatment of type 2 diabetes involves weight loss, diet, exercise, and smoking cessation. Um, the medical management of type 1 diabetes involves insulin injections, and for type 2, it involves oral medications. And if unresponsive to oral medications, you have to go on to receive insulin injections. Um, in 2013, 382 million people were estimated to have diabetes worldwide. Type 2 diabetes accounts for 90% of cases, and it's the eighth leading cause of death in the world. Healthcare costs. Um, of uh, healthcare costs in 2012 are estimated to be more than $245 billion. So you can see it has a significant impact on our healthcare system and um, the amount of money we spend on it. So here's just a little graph that shows the estimated healthcare costs spent on chronic diseases, which diabetes is one of these in 2003 compared to 20 years later in 2023. And you can see it will have a significant economic impact. So the signs and symptoms of diabetes are increased uh, urination, increased thirst, and increased hunger, especially in the type 1 diabetics. But type 2 diabetics, these symptoms um, occur as well. And this is because of the increased blood sugar in your, the increased sugar in your blood causes you to be hungrier, thirsty, and urinate more frequently. So the diabetes causes complications because um, the sugar gets on the blood and it um, prevents the delivery of oxygen to tissues in the body. And these tissues that rely on the small blood vessels in the body and these tissues that are particularly affected are the heart, the kidney, the nerves, and the eyes because they all have small blood vessels that deliver oxygen to these critically important tissues that require a lot of oxygen. So the diagnosis of diabetes is based on um, checking your blood glucose level. Most often people will have a fasting blood glucose greater than 126. They'll also have a number called hemoglobin A1C that I encourage all my patients to know because that's about 120 days. It measures the amount of, or it measures how high your blood sugars have been in the past 120 days. So it's a good estimation to see how well or how little your diabetes is controlled. Um, diabetes has um, a lot of eye complications. Of these, the first one I'd like to talk about is cataracts, then followed by glaucoma, then diabetic retinopathy. Um, cataracts are a natural part of aging, and I tell all my patients that if you live long enough, you'll develop cataracts. It's just something that happens with age. However, in diabetics, they develop the cataracts sooner. And most oftentimes, that's because the, the glucose or the blood sugar is high and it can cause swelling of the lens. A cataract is just when the lens and the eye gets bigger and changes shape and color as you get older. But when uh, diabetics have high blood sugar, the lens swells and that repeated swelling and then unswelling will cause changes in cataracts sooner. So the only treatment we have right now is cataract surgery. It's the most common surgery performed in the world. Um, and it's pretty straightforward surgery, but diabetics do have to have this earlier. 
Also, diabetics are at an increased risk for developing glaucoma. And whether or not that's a function of the disease itself or that diabetics have more frequent eye exams is kind of an issue of debate right now. But we do know that more patients with diabetes are treated for glaucoma. There are two types of glaucoma that diabetics can develop. These are primary open angle glaucoma and uh, neovascular glaucoma. The treatment for glaucoma is drops, laser, and surgery. How many people in this room have glaucoma? We have a lot of you. And you can tell that the drops are a lifelong thing in most patients and you don't get off them. So most times when you start patients on drops, you have to tell them you're going to be on them for the rest of your life. Next, I want to talk about diabetic retinopathy. Diabetic retinopathy is a leading cause of vision loss in adults aged 24 to 74. It affects approximately 4.1 million people, and it causes progressive visual loss by affecting the small blood vessels of the retina. The retina is the tissue in the back of the eye that's responsible for taking light, making it into a nerve signal, and transporting it to the back of the brain. So there are two types of diabetic retinopathy. There's a non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and there's proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So in non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, this is when the changes to the small blood vessels begin to develop. Um, we see, uh, sorry, that says macroaneurysms, this should say microaneurysms, uh, dot blot hemorrhages and heart exudates, which is a little cholesterol deposit that leaks out of the blood vessels and can cause swelling around it, resulting in vision loss. And we have proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which new abnormal blood vessels form. And when these new abnormal blood vessels form, they aren't as strong as the normal blood vessels that you were born with. So when these abnormal blood vessels form, they have a tendency to break. And when they break, you can develop a vitreous hemorrhage, which is bleeding into the vitreous in the eye, or you can develop small retinal hemorrhages in the front of the eye, or in, inside the retina and in front of it. So here are two photographs. Um, on your left, you'll have a picture of non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And on your right, we have a picture of proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So here in the non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, this is what we look at when we look in the back of your eye. We first look at the optic nerve, make sure it's uh, normal in appearance. But then you also notice there's lots of hemorrhages these blood spots in the retina associated with these heart exudates also in the retina, in the macula, which is the fine central part of vision that Dr. Davis was talking about in the last lecture. But then on your right, you'll see proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And this is a patient who has rather severe disease. You see some areas of fibrosis and traction, which occurs with long-standing diabetes. We have an area of bleeding that's in an inferior portion of the retina. And then we have a lot of uh, blood caused from those new abnormal blood vessels that develop and the weakening of the pre-existing blood vessels that you already have. A major cause of vision loss in uh, patients with diabetes is what's called diabetic macular edema. Diabetic macular edema is... Um, Swelling. That's just the medical term for swelling. So diabetic, uh, ma the macula is responsible for your fine central vision. And diabetes causes swelling in the macula. See all these little holes right there? These are abnormal. And those are associated with decreased vision. So in all patients who have diabetes, uh, on our initial exam, we see them and we perform a vision and a pressure and a pupil check. We always want to check the lens to evaluate their cataract, their optic nerve to make sure there's no evidence of neovascularization or glaucoma, and their retina to uh, determine whether or not they have proliferative or non-proliferative diabetes. We also, in our office, we perform an OCT, which is an ocular coherence topography to mo um, on all our patients to check for macular edema. Have you guys ever had this test done? Yes, every time you go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. This is just a good test to make sure there's no swelling in the macula. Um, 
Additionally, in our patients, we perform a fluorescein angiography, which Dr. Davis talked about in his last test too. This is where you inject dye into the blood and you evaluate the blood flow to the retina. It helps detect areas of uh, new and abnormal blood vessel growth, which is called neovascularization. So this picture right here shows a normal retina. And then here is a picture of a patient with non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which is kind of the precursor to bad, the bad form of the disease, which is proliferative diabetic retinopathy. See all these little white spots right here? Those are all abnormal new uh, or abnormalities with your pre-existing blood vessels in your retina that are causing these little leaky kind of pouches in them. And then here on your right, we have proliferative diabetic retinopathy with uh, some areas of neovascularization. See this, if you see this black spot right here, that's a, a retinal hemorrhage or preretinal hemorrhage. And then you have some neovascularization up here. So this patient has rather severe form of the disease that has probably caused maybe mild to severe vision loss, but if untreated, it will eventually lead to severe vision loss. So the treatment um, depends on two things. One, whether or not you have a proliferative versus non-proliferative diabetes, and the second portion of that is whether or not you have macular edema. So to treat macular edema, we give uh, shots in the eye. How many people have had shots in the eye? A lot of you. So these shots are what are called anti-VEGF shots. And what they do is they, um, the VEGF is produced by the retina to produce new and abnormal blood vessels. But the anti-VEGF uh, prevents that VEGF from forming these new abnormal blood vessels. So there are three types of shots that we can put in the eye for uh, macular edema. Well, actually a little bit more than that. But the three types of anti-VEGF shots are called Avastin, Lucentis, and Ilea. Ilea is the newest one of the three. And then sometimes, um, if patients don't respond to these anti-VEGF agents, we'll have to do additional treatments. These additional treatments include laser to the macula, it's called focal laser, or you'll have to have a steroid injection. The problem with steroid injections is that they can cause elevated eye pressure, and that elevated eye pressure can go on to cause glaucoma. So in patients with glaucoma, you don't want to give them any steroid injections. So the treatment of NPDR is to go see your, your lovely, friendly doctor, like Dr. Davis, um, every couple months and get a dilated eye exam. The frequency of follow-up depends on the severity, severity of your eye disease. So if you have very mild, non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, your doctor will probably choose to see you back about once every nine months to 12 months. But if you have a little bit more severe, severe disease, um, the doctor may see you back every six months, every four months, maybe even every month if you have macular edema. The treatment for proliferative diabetic retinopathy involves two treatments. Um, first, you might, or three. First, you might do an intravitreal injection of one of those anti-VEGF drugs that I talked about, the Avastin, Ilea, or Lucentis. That just prevents any new uh, blood, abnormal blood vessel growth. The next thing you want to do is do laser, as shown here, to the peripheral retina tissue to kind of kill some of it. And by killing the retina, we prevent that, that VEGF that I talked about earlier from creating new abnormal blood vessels. Eventually, though, if this uh, proliferization, uh, the continued neovascularization occurs, you might have to have surgery to prevent total and complete vision loss. So the prognosis of uh, diabetic retinopathy is based on the extent of the disease. And I counsel all my patients that it's really important to maintain good blood pressure, uh, good blood sugar, and just good healthy habits in order to um, prevent the disease from taking your, all your vision. So that I would like to open up the floor for questions. And uh, does anybody have any questions? OK. Yes, sir. The 
treatment uh, st stem cells in the treatment of diabetic retinopathy? So there are no uh, stem cell treatment for diabetic retinopathy per se, but they are experimenting with some sort of stem cells in the pancreas that can help produce insulin, not necessarily in type 2 diabetics, but in type 1 diabetics. So it doesn't have any role in the eye disease necessarily. And, uh, another question I have is, uh, uh, when, uh, is, is it possible for the condition of retinopathy to stabilize itself without uh, uh, getting bad? And uh, could it be uh, on, a, on a plane of stabilization? Yes, yes. Sometimes diabetes is sta diabetic retinopathy is stable for years and years and years without uh, progressing to the severe form of the disease. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Oh, right there. Can I have a question? Yes, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I don't think your microphone's on, but I can. I have a history of um, diabetes uh, in my family, mm -hmm. okay. and I was just um, um, I saw my doctor, and they told me that I'm going for uh, pre-diabetic needs. So, okay. And um, I've been having problems with my eyes. How do you know if you have? Um, uh, diabetic uh, syndrome from the That's eye. a good question. So the most important thing you do is you, when, if you're diagnosed with diabetes is you need to go see an eye doctor because through our examination, we use special lenses to look in the back of the eye. And those special lenses let us look at the retina and the lens, the cataract, and the optic nerve. And by these methods, we can see different exam changing, changes that you can't see. So it's just important to go see an eye doctor because they'll be able to tell you whether or not you have diabetic retinopathy. Okay, hello? Yes. I'm over here. Okay. Um, my question is, I'm totally blind from diabetic retinopathy. I've been blind for 20 years. My question is, is there a surgery, a surgery to restore vision? And then also someone said, a doctor said no, you would need a whole eye transplant. Have you heard of a whole eye transplant? So the f answer to your second question is right now, there is no such thing as a whole eye transplant. Maybe a few years down the road, there might be some new developments. Um, but right now, there's no um, current whole eye transplants. Mm -hmm. To answer your first question, You know, uh, for big research studies like um, retinitis pigmentosa, I know that it's a very devastating disease. And um, most university settings that have a genetic institute um, can probably offer you more insight into what genetic studies are currently available. You're welcome. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I have a friend. Um, He's, he was, well, he's been blind all his life. He's ROP like me. And uh, he's had weight problems for years, but he, the, he has type 2 diabetes. And recently they found out that he has a bleeding ulcer. He's, he's never watched, really watched his diet. Uh, they put him on a diet, but he didn't follow it. And does that have, when you have, does that have a bleeding ulcer, would that have anything to do with diabetes? No, a bleeding ulcer won't have anything to do with diabetes, but weight gain and obesity do have something to do with diabetes. And diabetes is a growing problem in the U.S. for a few reasons. Not so much in California. Um, I'm from the South, and there are a lot of obese people in the southern part of the United States. And obesity, if you're obese, you have a higher rates of diabetic retinopathy because your body is not as sensitive to insulin. In making a differential diagnosis between NPDR and PDR. Even with the best examiners, sometimes subtle macular edema can be missed on your slit lamp exam by the doctor. So it's important to get these tests done. Um, I like to do it on every diabetic patient, on every exam. 
and they you're not necessarily charged for them if there's not anything wrong with the exam, but it's a good screening test. Yes, sir. Uh, these treatments uh, that for the retinopathy, are they for just stabilization, uh, slowing down the progress, or can they reverse the condition? Um, both, and all of the above. So these treatments can prevent further vision loss, stabilize what vision loss you have, and in some cases, for example, if you have macular edema and you treat with the intravitreal injections, which are the shots in the eye, they will actually, uh, and the edema goes away, your vision can even be improved. So that's a good question. Okay. Yeah, uh, I've been blind since birth, and I became an, a diabetic when I was 47. Is it possible for me to get a pressure? Sometimes. Um, so, sir, are you asking me about patients who have low pressure in the eye? Uh, yes. Yes. Some patients can have low pressure in the eye. Um, if you've had several surgeries on the eye, for example, that can cause low pressure in the eye. Um, but most patients who, uh, like you, who you can't have a pressure, you, your, your eye might not, be, might not be able to see very well, depending on what other problems you have. That's not necessarily glau glaucoma is a pressure of maybe more than 21. But low pressure doesn't cause glaucoma. Does that answer your question? <laughs> okay, we have our last question up front, Jane. Okay. During the day in the sunshine, when I look at the, at the sky and and the light, I can I can my eye can. It's well. It's hard. the 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 light affects. It comes in and it's. It just makes it really hard. And I get like spots in front of my eyes. And how do you stop that? When um, it depends on what the cause of the spot is. Sometimes you can be sensitive to light because your eyes are dry. Sometimes if you have cataracts, they can cause scattering of light. Um, I would recommend wearing sunglasses when you go outside, as that can kind of help uh, with light sensitivity. Okay, I use them. And I, I remember when I was young, one or two years old, I was, I was looking at the sunset, and I was looking right at it, and my eyes the color started to get really blurry. And then later when I was like 12 years old, my eyes changed and the colors were even more blurry. I don't know how that happened. It was so strange. It was growing up. I'd go outside and I'd look at the, and the sunlight and it just happened. Well. You know, uh, some patients, depending on what type of eye disease you have, can be very sensitive to sunlight. So it can also be dryness. Um, it's hard to say. It's good to see, you know, ask your doctor based on your eye examination what he or she says. Passion. He teaches people who are blind and visually impaired how to use many of today's popular portable solutions, such as the iPhone, the iPad, Android phones, and the many accessible apps that are available to increase independence and productivity. He has presented at the Best in Tech Conference, the CCLVI ACB National Convention, as well as other events hosted by the NFBC San Fernando Valley Chapter. He facilitates a monthly assistive technology discussion group called Tech Talk at the Center for the Partially Sighted in Tarzana. And thanks to Airs LA, he has contributed to podcasts dedicated to portable and other assistive technology solutions. Please help me in welcoming Julian Vargas. Uh, 
All right, good morning, everybody. <laughs> so we've heard about lots of really uh, interesting information about eye conditions and research and things like that. Uh, but what I want to talk about are solutions that help those of us who uh, are going through or, or, or have vision loss of varying degrees, how to be um, more independent, how to be and more involved in life. And I believe that the advent of what I refer to as mobile or portable assistive technology really goes a long way toward doing that. Because of all the miniaturization uh, and, and um, research, everything that's been done, uh, we have power, very powerful devices that we can hold in our hands. So. Um, when I first became involved with uh, portable solutions, I always used to say, I think this is the future. Well, the fact is, it's, it's the now and continues on into the future. Um, it's really nice to have these very small and powerful uh, devices, like I said, that we can just fit in our hand or stick in our pocket. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, uh, some of you may remember things like uh, the visual tech, Anybody work with those? Uh, desktop uh, CCTV systems that were huge and were in black and white and uh, the, the contrast and everything on it wasn't that great. Well, uh, uh, we've had a lot of advancements in uh, camera technology and miniaturization and now, for example, in Maggard, um, and uh, take notes, as well as have access to digital and audio books. Uh, this is very important, especially as a student. Uh, instead of having to carry big textbooks in your backpack, <laughs> especially if you needed large print or braille, uh, it's nice to have the ability now to have this in digital form where we carry a little device with us that helps us with that. So there's a lot of neat stuff. They also have uh, color identifiers, a lot of really neat portable gadgets that are made for people with low or no vision, which have really improved our lives. But I think one of the biggest advancements that we've had come in the area of mainstream technology. I'm sure some of you have heard of things uh, called iPhones and Android phones, right? <laughs> well, uh, you really think of these devices more, at least I do, as tiny pocket size or handheld computers. In fact, the average iPhone, just to give you an example, is just as if not more powerful than your average desktop computer system. And a, a neat little fact that I found out about not too long ago, the average iPhone actually has more power and, and processing capability than the computer that was sent to fr send the first man to the moon. So that's a lot of power. So uh, I always say to clients and students, if you think of this device as just a phone, you're really uh, cheating yourself and, and, and limiting your capabilities because it can do so much more. One of the greatest things about both uh, iOS and Android devices is that they both have built-in accessibility, both for uh, people with low vision as well as people with no vision. So gone are the days where you used to have to buy a smartphone and then on top of that have to pay another $300 to install software that gave you something close to what sighted people are able to do with a similar device. Now it's all built in and it doesn't cost us a penny more because the companies, because it's put into all the devices, it's spread out across the whole product line, thus making it so that we can buy the same device that everybody else buys and use it in the same way and be just as uh, connected and as powerful. It's also more affordable. Because again, it's not, a, it's not a product that's just being targeted to a niche market, which is what we are. Uh, because it's being sold worldwide, um, it costs each the cost of each unit is significantly less. And the other nice thing about that as well is that manufacturers or, or developers of apps, if you will, and apps are just little programs that run on these devices, similar to what you run on your Windows or, or Mac computer, these are little programs that run on these powerful computers that use the hardware of the device to give us all types of capabilities. So because the app developer doesn't have to also build hardware, 
uh, the cost of the solutions also goes down significantly. These devices are always, almost always online. The, the um, average iPhone and even a lot of the uh, iPads and, and tablets that uh, have the capability are always connected to the internet, which means that they have access to absolutely the latest information and capabilities. So, so what are some of these things you can do with an iPhone or an Android phone? Uh, we talked about the, uh, the CCTV magnification solutions earlier. You can also do this with these portable devices by way of apps that are in the App Store. And depending on your vision condition, uh, they have, for example, a, a lot of just magnifier apps. That, that's all they do. And in fact, some people even don't need an app. They just launch the camera part of the phone, and the screen shows what the camera sees. And for some people, that's enough. But for people like myself who need the difference contrast, like the black background and the white writing, they now have magnification apps that do this as well. I will say that um, they're not quite as solid as the standalone devices, but I think as the, uh, as the, the power increases in the processing, as the operating systems are written to take advantage of the capability and, and more efficiently, um, it's getting closer and closer. But for spot reading situations, and if you don't want to carry 20 things with you, um, you can have a magnifying app that might help you in the grocery store to look at a price tag or something like that. Also, optical character recognition that I talked about before. There are now apps for both iPhone and Android that do this, where you can take a picture of, say, something you get in the mail, and within seconds have it converted to text that's read aloud to you. Really wonderful. When you consider that back in the 70s when Ray Kurzweil first invented his reading machine, it was $50,000 and as big as a home appliance. And now, for as little as $99, you can buy the KNFB Reader app for the iPhone that uh, is just as powerful. Also, you can do object recognition and barcode scanning, which also helps me tremendously when I'm grocery shopping, because now I don't have to struggle with a video magnifier or deal with eye strain. Now I just aim to where I've learned barcodes are in a lot of products, and within seconds I'm told things like what, is, what the product is. If I'm using the individual store app, sometimes I can get the price or have the ability to add it to my loyalty card as a special. You can also use the devices to keep informed, as I do. Uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I read a lot of uh, emails from uh, message lists and such. So there are apps that uh, can stream podcasts. For example, Airs LA has an app for both iOS and Android. There's something called iBlink Radio from Saratech that also offers quite a lot of, of different information. And, um, I, I keep informed this way, and a lot of you can as well. You can also do audio and ebook reading on these devices. And I have to say that uh, historically, we have never had as much access to the written word as low or no vision users as we do today, thanks to this type of technology. We can access not just through the BARD app in the National Library Service or through Bookshare, which are great services, but we can also buy iBooks. We can buy books from Amazon and, and Barnes and & Noble and read them on our portable devices just like everybody else can because of the built-in accessibility. GPS navigation and orientation, another big one for me. Um, I now can uh, be on a bus, for example, and hear the intersections that I'm approaching. I can make uh, pedestrian or, or vehicle routes to things real easy. I can find out addresses. I can look up places of business. I can arrange transportation for myself through uh, apps like Uber and Lyft. So getting around is just super easy because of this technology. And of course, uh, we shouldn't forget communication because after all, it is, it is a phone. So it makes and receives calls. You can manage and use a contact list successfully. You can send and receive text messages, uh, which include pictures and videos and audio. Uh, you can also read your email. In fact, it's my favorite way to read email now is using my iPhone. I don't like using the desktop computer because I can do it faster on the iPhone. And of course, you can be entertained. There are, are myriad apps out there that uh, stream music, uh, radio stations. If you want to listen to actual radio stations in places, you can do that through apps. 
Um, you can also stay connected through social media, Facebook, Twitter, all of these uh, ways that everybody is connecting these days. We are no longer isolated from this type of interaction with people. We can be right there, with, like everybody else, reading what's happening with, in the lives of our loved ones, friends, colleagues, etc., and contribute to the discussion. So that's just the, kind of a snapshot of things that are available with the, with the portable and mobile assistive technology. I want to tell you guys real quickly about an event that I happen to be on the planning committee of that's coming up on the 22nd of this month called the Best in Tech Conference. Have any of you attended the Best in Tech? All right. Well, I hope to see more of you there because this is a free event. It's a day-long event, and it is dedicated solely to the discussion of various types of assistive technology. Uh, we have some wonderful sponsors that uh, make it possible for us to offer this for free. So all of you are welcome to come. Bring your family, friends, loved ones, anyone who you think can benefit from this. We'll have workshops in the early part of the morning by uh, some of the uh, gold sponsors to show you the latest uh, technology that they have available. We have the main part of the presentation, which is where people talk about their favorite assistive technology solution for the year. It's uh, many presentations by a whole panel. And these are not vendors. These are average, everyday users. And some of the information they have to offer can help you, perhaps, in purchasing and buying decisions that you may be considering. So uh, if anybody would like more information about that, I will be at the uh, table, one of the tables inside the fair. You can come up and see me. I have flyers. I can give you the uh, information. If any of you would like my contact information to perhaps arrange some assistive technology training, any consulting, uh, tech support, et cetera, I offer all those services, I can be reached at area code 818-794-9550. Or you can go to my website, www.techjv.com. That's T-E-C-H-J-V, like my initials, dot com. And there I've got uh, contact information. I also have links to presentations and podcasts. For example, like a podcast that I host with Dr. Bill Takeshta uh, at Airs LA. And it's dedicated to the discussion of smartphone technology. So... The phone number is area code 818-794-9554. The website is www.tech, T-E-C-H, J like John, V like Victor, dot com. So um, if you guys like, I can take a few Questions, try to keep them sort of generalized because I know that we can get fairly in-depth here and I know that I, some of you are itching to go in there and get your hands on all the cool gadgets that are in that other room. So I'll answer a few questions and any questions that, that I can't take here, you can come see me at the table where I'll be and I'll be happy to help you. So you, in the, in the uh, just to clarify, if you have a question to ask, can you raise your hand and wait till the microphone is there so that um, everybody else can hear it? Could you comment on the use of uh, Dragon on a computer uh, to convert uh, conversation to text? Yes, you're talking about um, dictation. Uh, Dragon was one of the first products to offer that and still does. And of course, we now have it on our smartphones as well. On the iPhone, it's called Siri. On, on the Android phones, a lot of times it's called uh, Google Now or in Samsung devices, S Voice. On Windows mobile phones, it's called Cortana. So this is becoming a very popular way of inputting text. And you know, again, this is a, this is, the, is a testament to the power of this small technology. Before, you used to need huge computers with huge processing power to do this. Now you can do this all on a tiny hmm? device. So uh, what I could say about the, such solutions is that they do help people, especially uh, with motor skill uh, disabilities where you can't type as fast or if you just don't want to type at all. And with a little bit of training and a little a bit of knowing how it works by, for example, learning how to speak things like your punctuations and new lines and, and such like that, you can actually get pretty good results with voice dictation on all the computer platforms. Do we have any classes offered in, uh, in the Institute to, for use of um, 
Dragon or use of uh, computers? Uh, that would be a question to direct to the personnel at Braille. I, I don't work here. I believe he's asking if there are any classes offered here in the use of uh, Dragon Speak or any type of dictation technology. Absolutely. So they do have that. I Absolutely. Have we that. have, and actually, Connection Point, uh, you'll hear more about. You're more than welcome to go inside Connection Point today. This is Anita speaking, if you don't know the voice already. But Connection Point is our latest, greatest technology uh, opportunity. It's a It. <laughs> um, Connection Point is our newest, greatest piece of work here for Braille Institute, and it's technology-driven, mainstream technology as well as um, assistive technology. So everything that you think that you may want to experience, hopefully we have there for you to try out. We are starting to make appointments for individuals to come through. We'll have classes. As you know, we already have assistive technology classes that are supported by Tanya Pena and Francis Daniels, and you can learn mainstream uh, per, uh, uh, technology there as well. But we're really working to expand our services through Connection Point. So grow with us, and we will grow with you. So, and we appreciate that question because it's very important to us that we stay up with the 2000s and we're arriving. So please go and see Connection Point. It will be out of your door going toward the, the elevator in the main building on your right-hand side. And we'll have a trip. Um, no, I'm just teasing. I was going to have, we'll have a speed bump there so you'll know that that's where you are. <laughs> but that's my joking, okay? Uh, any other questions? And I apologize for our PA system. I'm going to take my friend's question back here. I get my exercise, yay. Hi. Yes, my question is, do you have voice recognition software that would help me navigate websites and then once I find the site I'm looking for, have it read to me what's on the screen? The power of, of these voice assistants continues to get better with every new uh, major update to the operating systems. You know, before it used to be that you can tell your phone, call this number, do this, and, and that would be it. And now, uh, as they've updated it, they, they've given it more capabilities. You can use it to launch applications. On the iPhone, for example, ever since uh, last year with iOS 7, you can actually pick up any iOS device and press and hold that home button and say, turn voiceover on. And it'll say, OK, I turned on voiceover. And now a blind person can interact with that device which is really nice because now you can go to the Apple store and play with any device you want and not have to wait or try to find a salesperson to do it for you. So it, they are becoming more powerful. You can do voice searches with it. For example, there's a uh, Google application on iOS that I think is really nice. And in fact, I like it better than Siri for a lot of things where I could ask it, what is the address to such and such a business or what is the phone number to that? And it will look it up and read it aloud to me and allow me to just interact without even having to continuously touch the device. So um, I don't know if how, I don't know if, as far as whether you can go to open a website and then just tell it, go this, navigate by heading. I don't think they're quite there yet, but uh, it's getting there. It, it, every, uh, every major update sees new advancements in this area. Right. So Julian, the, que the other question was that if I don't have a Mac, I don't have a smartphone, but I still want a device that can speak back to me, the answer to that question would be our JAWS, the JAWS program and or CDesk and or ZoomText. There are multiple uh, support devices or support applications that are on the market and that we actually help instruct here at the organization to support those who are wanting to learn how to use JAWS or use CDesk or use ZoomText. Okay, are there any other questions? Here I come. Gretchen. Oh, okay. Here we go. I'm going to hold it because it's. Here. Hey, Julian, this is Gretchen. Hey. Hey. 
Um, is there a device other than, because I know you have said all your um, apps are through your iPhone, but suppose I want to go to the grocery store and no, I don't have an iPhone. Is there a device I could take with me to be able to uh, know how much I'm paying for the items in the store that will take, tell me the prices in the store? Well, I was getting ready to suggest the ID made, but then you mentioned you want actual prices. <laughs> this is where we, this is again where it's important uh, the significance of the internet connected device. The ID mate is great just for reading barcodes on products and finding out what they are and learning all kinds of things like cooking directions, etc. But because it's not connected to the internet, it's, um, and it's not, even if it was, it's not connected to the actual store's database, it's difficult to do that. So this is again where an Android or an iPhone right. comes in handy. Because, like, let's say you're shopping at Walmart. Walmart has a really nice app. And when you use their barcode scanner, it tells you what the product is, and it tells you the price. Because, it, it, because it's accessing their database. Whereas if, if you're using an app like, let's say, Digitize, which works a little bit more like the ID Mate, there's this great database of products, but it's not going to tell you prices. So you need something that connects to the stores or the vendors database to have access to that information. Okay, we wanna thank Julian Vargas for this opportunity to share this information with us. And again, if you'd like to meet Julian and, and, and get his number, I'm sure he'll be outside as well waiting for you. It's time, Judy's coming back to the stage and I wanna say thank you to all the teams that came together today to put this, to make this the success that it is. Yay, it's a wonderful success. So Judy is about to introduce a, a very special person to us, to Brill Institute, and um, provide us with opportunities for maybe some free stuff. Yes, indeed, it's very close to the time of the opportunity drawings. However, another reminder before we go on to that, Please remember that if you are using an interpretation device, we need you to turn it back in before you leave. Okay, next thing. As you know, Braille Institute is a major proponent of the use of technology to stay connected to the world around you. And we'd like to thank all of the vendors for being here today for our technology fair. And for those of you in the audience, please be sure to visit each table to learn more. And now I'd like to reintroduce Enhanced Vision, a leading developer of easy-to-use magnification devices and accessible technology for people with low vision. I'd like to welcome to the stage Mark Gregett of Enhanced Vision to help us announce today's opportunity drawing winners. Welcome, Mark. I see a lot of friendly faces here. How are you guys today? Bye. Is anybody here? Do they want to win? How are you today? There they are. I love it. I love it. Uh, let's give it up again for Braille. They put on a phenomenal seminar. A, a lot of hard work. A lot of hard work goes into what they do just to Pull put this on. So You're too strong. Too strong. You're a he-man. Should I talk like this? Oh, no. no, sorry, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Anyways, let's give some stuff away, some cool, cool stuff. Uh, first, we've got Department of Aging. We have a grab bag of necessary items. Go ahead there, Vanna. Okay, can I just wait one oh. moment? Did everyone in the room receive a ticket? No. Oh, my goodness. Did I... no. Say it again. Wait, 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 not, not you guys. I know you didn't get it, but hold on, I'm getting information. Wait, 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 wait. When people registered... Everyone's name is in the bowl. I have to tell you, the bowl stands two feet deep by four feet wide. It's kind of like, oh, no, a, it's a, it's like a hot tub, kind of. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. This is the Department of Aging grab bag of necessary items. And drum roll, please. 
Well, that's Demolala. a slap, guys. We have to work on drum roll. What's a drum roll? All right. And the first winner Thank is... You. Anita, you can't sign up for that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, Herbert Bax. Herbert. There he is. A round of applause for Herbert, please. Hello. And the next thing we're going to give away, scan healthcare and independence at home, a tote bag for fitness and exercise. I have to tell you that Vanna is, by the way, of, um, from Italy. By name of Manuel, so. Vanna is Italian, isn't it? Vanna yep. is Italian. There you go. <laughs> I think Vanna looks a little different than Manuel, though. All right. And go ahead and draw a name, please. Harry Jackson. Harry Jackson. Oh my God. There he is. My All good buddy, Harry back. Jackson. Give it up for Harry. He's also a very, very dedicated veteran as well. So thank you for your service, Harry. All right. Mini Pharmacy. We have two $10 Starbucks gift cards. Who likes coffee? I couldn't, I couldn't tell by how much coffee you guys drank today. <laughs> well, we have oh. to give our tea drinkers a fair shake, too. Oh, that's true. That's true. Who drinks tea? Ah. Oh, and it's also going to come with a free glucometer. Just in case you put sugar in your coffee. And a, the card is inside the box. All right. Drum roll, please. Oh, much better. Much it. better. I love it. Carlos Campo. Carlos Campo, come on down. Well, you must be present to win. Going once. Going twice, two and a half, three times. I say the lady. he's gone. All right, he's gone. Next. Same winning possibility. All right. Carla. Uh, I don't know. Maradiaga. Maradiaga. Ah. Well, raise your hand, Carla. Carla. Right there, there she is, right in front. I think Carla was just saying, I never win. Yeah. They're only gonna call the men, ha ha. There you go, congratulations, Carla. All right. And then we've got a $50 gift card from Humanware. It's a Target card. Who doesn't love Target, seriously? Because they have humans at Target. <laughs> <laughs> hey <-o. laughs> All right, go ahead. Helen Halloran. Helen Halloran. Helen, are you here? Helen? Going once. Wow, $50. Twice. 2.5. Helen? No Helen? I'll be Helen. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. All right. You got to pick better winners, Justin. What's going on here? James Hogan. James Hogan? Wow. No? Check your James? ID card to make sure you're not James Hogan. I think Vanna is scaring him away. What the? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one more. All right. Arlene Hogan. I think if James isn't here, probably Arlene is probably not going to be here as well. Just, just a, a thought. I think they left for Vegas, is That's what I right. hear. Okay, Rose Taylor. Rose Taylor. Wow. We're calling everybody that's not here. Sorry to waste your time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. All right. Lamar Crudup. Crudup. Crudup? Yes. Lamar Crudup? No. Oh, my goodness. No. Oh, boy. It's $50, people. Francis Nelson. Francis Nelson. Francis Nelson? Oh, Lamar is here? No. No? You have to be present to yeah. win. Okay. Okay, we're going to mix them up. This is like the Powerball. <laughs> and you can't pick your name, Justin. All right. 
Karina Olivares. Karina. Yay! 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 Oh, winner, winner, chicken dinner. Okay. All right. So now for the main prize, we have the Pebble HD 4.3. This is one of our most popular portable products. If you are interested in any of other products, we have a stand out back. And go ahead and draw a name, please. Shishido Betty. Betty Shishido. Hell, there she is. Congratulations. And Betty, come up and see us afterwards as well. We're going to get all your information. And the one thing that I love about doing drawings is why give one away? I mean, that just, that sounds awful. I think we should give two away. What do you, do you guys want another one? I can't hear you. What? There you go. I love it. All right. We're going to give another pebble away. All right, Javier Valero. Javier, there he is. Hey, there he is. Javier. Congratulations, Javier. And that is it. I think we broke the bank today. Okay, guys, so it looks like we've come to the end of this party. Uh, we will extend our services to the right and to outside, uh, to the left, actually. If you're going outside the door, you want to go left to our vendors and outside to also to our tables outside. We again want to thank all of you for spending your morning with Braille Institute. To all of our vendors, we say thank you. To all the students, staff, donors, everyone here, we appreciate who you are and what you mean to Braille Institute. Thank you.